Shakti. Si Presidente, nandiyan na. Meron po siyang recorded na ano siya. 1919 was an auspicious year in history. The First World War ended, ushering a drastic change in the world order. The Philippine Islands had been a U.S. territory for two decades and was promised independence under the Jones Law of 1916. Progressive reformers saw the country and its people as a major target for modernization, and education was its main weapon. Seven forward-looking Filipinas came together in 1919 to create a school where young women could gain the knowledge and skills that would make them modern women. Paz Marquez Benitez was the first president of the Philippine Women's College. Jose Abad Santos was its first chairman of the Board of Trustees. Francisca Tirona Benitez was the second president and with her husband, Dean Conrado, guided the school from a house on A. Flores Street to its iconic Taft Avenue campus. In 1932, the college became a university, making PWU the first university for women in Asia founded by Asians. It provided a space where innovations in education flourished and young people were encouraged to be the best that they could be. For over 100 years, the Philippine Women's University has been known as a leader in quality education. In 1934, PWU moved into its main campus on Taft Avenue, and since the 1970s has been co-educational. Located in the heart of Metro Manila, it is easily accessible by public transport and surrounded by affordable housing. Today's PWU offers undergraduate and graduate courses in several fields of study. Its business and management programs are responsive to the needs of industry using evolving technology for global competence. PWU graduates excel in arts and sciences, education, social work, and diplomacy. Its fine arts and music programs have produced outstanding graduates through a holistic education that treasures heritage as well as excellence. PWU has pioneered in fields such as food science, nutrition and dietetics, medical technology, pharmacy, and nursing. PWU continues to play an essential role in producing graduates who possess the skills that make them competitive in the country and anywhere in the world. To formally start our webinar, let us have a moment of silence to feel the presence of our Lord with a prayer followed by the national anthem.
We would like to welcome our 23 participants to this session, Plant-Based Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Researchers. Please be reminded of the house rules of the webinar. Please ensure a stable internet connection. And there will be a five-minute question and answer portion after each speaker's presentation. Type in your question at the comment box for the Q&A session. For the evaluation form, please click the link at the video description. Cutoff for the submission is until 6 p.m. Yes, and all your registered participants who completed the evaluation form will receive the e-certificate. And particip participants will be prompted to answer the Q&A session after each speaker's presentation. Once again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome for today's webinar series, Plant-Based Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Researches. Presented by the School of Food Science and Technology of the Philippine Women's University, we are now streaming live via PW YouTube channel and also PW Facebook page. This is the session of the series entitled Plant-Based Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Researches. We are your moderators. I am Joanna Crisol, a student of Food Science and Technology. And I am Alexa jones Pressure, a student of Food Science and Technology. First of all, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our esteemed guests for joining us today. Mr. Marco Alfredo, President of the Philippine Women's University. Dr. Mishita Dumlao, Program Chair of Information Technology and head of PW Technology Integration Team. And also Dr. Ligaya Braganza, Program Chair of School of Food Science and Technology. Dr. Ignacio Pablo, Ben Emeritus of School of Food Science and Technology. And also Ms. Maria Divina Alcazabas, Professor in Food Science. And also Mrs. Lavina Divina Tiramiras, Professor in Food Science. And to start our webinar series, here is Mr. Marco Alfredo Benitez, our president, for the opening remarks. Dr. Filini Young, University Chancellor in SVPAA. Dr. Ligaya Braganza, Program Chair of our School of Food Science and Technology. Our hardworking and innovative faculty, students and guests watching on our social media pages. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all of you to the School of Food Science and Technology's Food Tech Day webinar entitled Plant-Based Food Revolution on the Go, Innovative Undergraduate Researches. Last February, our graduate students from our MS in Food Science and Food Safety programs also held a webinar centered on the plant-based food revolution. In it, we cited the significance of a whole food, plant-based diet as being one of the healthiest diets not to mention the most environmentally friendly and sustainable. A diet composed mainly of unprocessed plant-based food helps to combat most of the leading causes of disease and mortality among humans. It also contributes to lessening the environmental harm coming from diets rich in meat and poultry. As somewhat of a follow-up to that webinar and as it, the plant-based food revolution continues to grow, I'm happy to see our undergraduate students organize this webinar focused also on a plant-based foods, on plant-based foods that are nutritious, delicious, affordable, locally sourced, and can be consumed on the go. There has been a misconception that a plant-based diet is hard to follow because meals take so much time and effort to prepare, are expensive, boring and bland, and have ingredients that are hard to come by. Well, today's webinar will show us that these misconceptions are simply that, and we will see how affordable locally sourced ingredients such as sweet potato, ube, and the lagundi plant can be used to produce healthy, affordable, and easy to prepare meals on the go. Since the 1960s, PW School of Food Science and Technology has offered innovative and multidisciplinary programs in food science and technology, which apply, apply a science and engineering based approach to the production, preparation, processing, packaging, distribution and utilization of food products suited and needed in the Philippines. We've attracted students looking for careers in food manufacturing, processing, research and development, and in many of the country's renowned food and beverage companies. Today's webinar is another opportunity to highlight the expertise of our students in this field and hopefully encourage our audience, many of whom are senior high school and tertiary students, 
to consider this area of study, especially considering the potential impact this has promoting sustainability and overall health in the country and globally. I'd like to congratulate our student organizers of this webinar and of course our PW School of Food Science and Technology led by Dr. Braganza for fostering the culture of research and innovation in our undergraduate program, for giving us a glimpse of the in-depth researches being conducted and for showing us that nutritious, delicious and affordable plant-based foods do not have to be complicated and can be easily accessible to everyone. Thank you very much and good afternoon. All right, so thank you for the warm opening remarks, Mr. Marco Benitez. Now we will also like to introduce our four speakers this afternoon. We have Ms. Ali Rayala, Ms. Angela Gajo, Mr. Mark Suya, and Ms. Carlea Duenas. They are undergraduate students of BS Food Technology under the research subject of Ms. Maria Divina Alcasabas, a professor in food science. We would like also to welcome our attendees to this session. So now we are indeed ready to begin our webinar series, right, partner? Yes, of course, partner. All right, so before we introduce our first speaker, their presentations today are the results of their thesis. And also, Ms. Joanna, do you ever wonder why more and more people are shooting choosing and shifting to plant-based foods? I guess people are seeking plant-based options for reasons ranging from weight and health management to saving money to eating more sustainably. Well, that's right, Ms. Joanna. And aside from that, plant-based food products are readily available in the market anywhere and everywhere. And to discuss more about plant-based foods, let me present to you our first speaker, She's a graduating student of bachelor's degree in food science and technology. She's also the president of PATH Delta chapter in PWU. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Ms. Ali Rayala to talk about healthy sizing pita bread with sweet potato, ipomea batatas. So, uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my thesis presentation uh, entitled Healthy Zizing Pita Bread with Sweet Potato or the Ipomea Batata Slam. To start off my presentation, the, these, are, these are the following reasons uh, why I choose sweet potato as my main subject. Uh, sweet potato is considered as one of the most nutritious fruit crop in the world, knowing that the fact that it contains high amounts of nutrients, not just within the flesh, but also in the roots and its leaf, uh, which contains uh, phytochemicals. So according to GH et al. 2015, uh, sweet potato has a high adaptability when it comes to different climate and farming systems. So aside from this, the economic importance of sweet potato in the Philippines likewise considered sweet potato production. According to Giammi et al. 2004, the flour is used as dough conditioner for bread, treats, and cakes and adds common sweetness, color, and flavor to processed food products. Sweet potato is, is a significant source of carbohydrates and it, and it achieves a fourth spot after rice, corn, and cassava. So as of now, uh, this har harvest is considered as a low, econ has a low economic value, yet it has a social significance due to the fact that it is generally used as an adaptable for snack food and it's utilized as staple food or a rice substitution in numerous nations. So the following are the objectives of the study that must be answered at the end of the presentation. First is to be able to determine the significant difference between and among the levels of sweet potato powder in terms of sensory attributes, to determine the nutrient content of the different levels of the sweet potato powder in pita bread, to determine the iron content of the most acceptable level of sweet potato in pita bread, and last is the, 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 to determine the direct material cost of the most acceptable pita bread. The chosen hypothesis was the sweet potato pita bread does not have a significant difference with the normal pita bread in terms of the different levels of sweet potato powder. So this research will be significant with the following. First is in the research development, 
Since this is a new product in the market, doing more follow-up research will help the industry in improving the formulation as well as, as well as the discovery of more usage of sweet potato powder in the food industry. Second is for the business owners, which is the sweet potato and uh, pita bread industry. Uh, the, uh, this in, the industries will be able to use this study as a base in doing further more innovation on its products, different utilization. And last but not the least, the consumers. Uh, introducing a new variety of pita bread will truly benefit consumers who are more focused or in particular with their diet, uh, such as people who are in gluten-free foods and giving them other options of pita bread that are, that are much healthier than the normal ones. So for the scope, uh, this involves the trials of product formulation in which there are different levels of sweet potato powder. Next is uh, a two-part of sensory evaluation test were conducted uh, with, uh, with 20 participants using the ranking test and 30 participants using the hedonic scale to be able to know their preferences. For the limitation, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the research had to follow different safety protocols. Moving forward, for the review of the related literature, uh, sweet potato, or in, or in its scientific name, the Ipomea batata slam, has been identified as a food security crop because it contains reasonable amounts of bioactive compound such as beta-carotene, uh, ascorbic acid, polyphenols, dietary fiber, as well as vitamins, minerals, particularly iron, calcium, and phosphorus, and proteins, according to NM Mozza et al. 2015. So according to the United States Department of Agriculture or the USDA, sweet potatoes have a lighter carbohydrate content than the other starch crop. So uh, this suggests that their potential for bioethanol on produ production on marginal lands. So the yield of sweet potato flour is still underutilized despite the fact that it is wealthy in starch and sugars and its flour can be utilized in various mechanical applications. So, as stated by the Food and Agriculture Organization, sweet potato ranks third as the most beneficial starchy food next to cassava and potato. So, here in our country, uh, sweet potato industry is widely, uh, is widely grown due to the fact that it can grow any time of the year. So, uh, next to that is it requires a least amount of fertilizer and other farm resources compared to other root crops that make that makes it more accessible for farmers. And good thing is our country managed to produce sweet potato not just economically but also environmentally. Uh, it is also foreseen that, uh, that sweet potato is economically important in our country because farmers not only use it for household consumption but others also rely to meet their economic needs. So according to the economic importance of sweet potato in the Philippines 2019, about 30% of our country's production are harvested and sold in our local markets. Uh, the sweet potato production in the country mostly came from Eastern Visayas. So with the 47.83 metric tons or the 62% of the total output of sweet potato, so as you can see in the graph, 62% uh, of the total output of the sweet potato, followed by Bicol region, which has 19.6% uh, of share, and Caraga with 18% of the total output. In fact, according to Major Vegetable and Root Crops Volume 14, Number 3, 2020, during the months of July to September 2020, the total amount of harvested potato went up to 137,000, metric tons, which is 2.7% higher compared from 134.06 thousand metric tons that was harvested in the same quarter of 2019. So as the years go by, the sweet potato production here, here in our country continuously rises. Uh, in terms of iron, of iron deficiency, the absence of dietary variety among poor communities has prompted uh, different nutritional consequences, especially with the micronutrient insufficiencies. So as what we've heard on televisions, which is the iron deficiency anemia, and the zinc inadequacy, which is our two genuine nourishing issues that influence the health and economic sector or area in our country. As you can see, uh, infant has, it has the 38% of the 38% uh, 
which is affected by iron deficiency, followed by pregnant women, which is 24.8%. Next is elderly males, which is 21.6%. And lastly, the lactating women, which is 15.7%. The Philippine government has proactively started different projects and arrangements to address this micronutrient in the adequacy, especially through the fortification of basic food commodity, commodities. So there are different um, gov uh, government uh, pro projects in which before the pandemic happened, uh, public schools were in, in, in public schools, uh, uh, there is this one program wherein they monitor or they have this feeding program in which uh, nutrient foods, uh, nutritious foods are being served with two children, uh, specifically uh, preschool. So for the recommended nutrient intake for iron, as stated by the Food and Nutrition Institute of the Department of Science and Technology, the daily iron requirement per day are, are the following. So for adults, uh, it is 12 to 28 milligrams per day. For the lactating women, it is 30 to 38 milligrams per day. So anemia can cause or can be seen a profound impact on human health and productivity on the first 1,000 days of life. So according to Palanog et al. 2009, current food intakes are unable to meet this requirement. So according to Van Hals et al. 2000, due to its distinct properties, the utilization of sweet potato flour in the preparation of bread is limited with the researchers prevailing replacement of 10 to 15 percent of wheat flour with sweet potato flour on a dry weight basis as most acceptable. But for other baked items, particularly sweet products, higher percentage or higher extents of sweet potato flour can be utilized or up to 10 to 100 percent. So to give you an additional information, as stated by Chen et al. 2002-2003, uh, there have been several attempts have been made to process sweet potato into other forms. So the most notable was in Asia, which is the noodle production. Uh, that happened around mid-1940s to 1960s. But this failed due to it did not meet the acceptable standard, mainly because uh, this kind of food before can only come from new technology supported by research and development. But as you observe now, you can see sweet potato everywhere from chips to flour, other forms, and it can be a substitute with other root crops as well. For the market and demand, data bridge market research analysis that the market is growing with a compound annual growth rate of 5.5% in the forecast period of 2021 to 2028. And it is expected to reach 47,361.13 million US dollars by the end of by 2028. So the high of demand of the sweet potatoes and the emerging economy accelerate the growth of the sweet potato market. Uh, moreover, uh, in the recent years, uh, sweet potato processing industries uh, have been into, introduced to new technologies and equipment to be able to improve the quality of their product. So at the same time as this happens, new ideas in raw materials, ingredients, and in product development, such as flavor and texture, have been brought forth. Uh, several types of sweet potato usage with various form and tastes have been developed to be able to meet the diversified demand of market consumption. For the research paradigm, input, health benefits of sweet potato, nutrient content of sweet potato, and the processing of the pita bread. For the process, formulation of pita bread with sweet potato, its sensory evaluation, nutrient analysis, and to compute for the direct material cost. And for the final output, the most acceptable pita bread with sweet potato. The, th the theoretical framework is as follows. Nutrition and health, the nutritional content of sweet potato flour to formulate the pita bread with sweet potato. In legislation, the allergen and its price, Food technology is the process, formulations, strategies, and sensory attributes. And lastly, the consumer's perspective, which is the initial consumer acceptance. So for the phase one preliminary test, a preliminary test was conducted to determine the significant differences among and between the samples that were formulated with the different levels of sweet potato powder. So the sweet potato, the pita bread with sweet potato are labeled as lot one for control, lot, lot two for 25%, 
lot 3 for 50%, and lot 4 with 75% sweet potato powder. For the process of production, this is the ingredients that were used in producing the pita bread with sweet potato powder as the main ingredient. Uh, as, as shown in the illustration, four different samples of pita bread were produced and coded as 710 as the control, 207, 980, and 685, wherein the control con consisted of 100% wheat flour. Uh, for the other samples as well, uh, sweet potato flour and other ingredients for pita bread production are used. Uh, for the phase, phase two sensory evaluation, the final sensory evaluation occurred last January 10, 2021 at Caloacan City. Uh, seven and nine point hedonic scale was used to determine the four samples that were presented. A total of 30 participants were gathered to score the appearance, taste, color, texture, aroma, taste, and its general acceptability. For the general acceptability, the nine point hedonic scale was used while for the sensory attributes, the seven point hedonic scale was used. All data that were gathered was interpreted by the 90% and 95% Kramer's test, analysis of variance, and if necessary, Duncan's multiple range test must be done. For the phase three nutrient computation, so the nutrients present in sweet potato was computed with the formula of value of nutrient time is gram per serving divided by 100 grams equals the theoretical nutrient computation of sweet potato. Uh, for the laboratory analysis, the most acceptable sample was submitted for a laboratory testing to determine the nutrient content, specifically iron. Uh, 300 grams of sample was given to Qualibet testing services last January 14, 2021, and they used the modified AOAC 20th edition 2016 procedure. To be able to know the price, the direct material costs were computed to identify the selling price. The raw materials that were used was added with the different indirect material costs that were consumed during the process. This will result to the cost of the pita bread. For the interpretation of findings, Ranking tests were used for consumers to rank the products according to their own preferences. Four samples were presented to 20 respondents and were asked to rank the following according to their preferences. So this, uh, the result in this uh, uh, ranking test was uh, interpreted using the 95 and 99% Kramer's test with a value ranging from 39 to 61 and 36 to 64 respectively. So as you can see, the, the 710 or control uh, was chosen first. So And then the sample 980, which is the 50%, was ranked fourth. The samples were ranked one to four, but these were not significantly different with each other. Therefore, these samples is comparable. Moving forward, the result of the mean sensory score is presented in the table according to the preferences of 30 participant panelists. With regards to appearance, aroma, and texture, lot 3 or the 50% formulation have the highest mean score, while for the color, taste, and general acceptability, lot 4 or the 25% formulation garnered the highest mean score. So the results were used to interpret it using the ANOVA, and if necessary, Duncan multiple range test will proceed. Uh, for the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, several factors affect the results since, the re since I incorporated different type of lar that contributed to the appearance, color, and taste of the samples presented. In addition to this, sensory attributes which resulted to significant was subjected to DMRT computation. In relation to the previous table that I show, there was a decrease in scores as the level of sweet potato flour were added. However, after subjecting it to the analysis of variance, the decrease was not significant in terms of aroma, texture, and its general acceptability. The result revealed that the appearance, color, and taste valid, varied significantly between the control with with 100% whole wheat flour and other sample that was incorporated with the sweet potato powder. Also, a similar trend also observed by Hamen et al. year 1973 
in which the addition of sweet potato flour to wheat flour caused a decrease in extensibility of the dough. For the DMRT result of appearance, in which appearance is usually the first thing that the consumers notice every time they purchase a certain food product. So as shown in the table, lot, five, uh, lot 3 or sample 980 and lot 4, which is sample 685, has a significant difference uh, in terms of taste due to that it contains 50% and 75% of sweet potato powder respectively. So with the legend LS are like slightly, LM for like moderately, and VML for very much like. So in terms of color, a lot four or sample 685 and lot three with lot one is significantly different with lot one and lot two of samples with lesser percentage of sweet potato powder as well as the lot 2 and lot 1, which is 25% formulation of and the control. Sample with higher amounts of sweet potato powder is comparable such, such that the 50% and the 75% formulation. So uh, to follow is the taste, in which taste is the key factor that determines the acceptability of any item, which has the highest effect similarly as market accomplishment of the item is concerned. So lot 4, which is the 75% formulation, is comparable with lot 2 and lot 1, which is the 25% and the control respectively. So lot 3, which is the 50% formulation, is also comparable in terms of taste. The rest, which is the lot 4 or the 75% formulation, and lot 3 or the 50% is not significantly different in terms of taste alongside with sample 710, the control, and sample 207, which is the 25% formulation. For the phase 3, nutrient computation, the following results are based on the above-mentioned nutrient content of sweet potato powder, considering that each, each pita bread has an edible portion of 30 grams per serving. Calcium is an essential for supporting, supporting bone formation and development. The pita bread contains 9 mg of calcium, which is 1.8% of the recommended nutrient intake for adults. The expanded beta-carotene substance could be from both the yellow species of orange flesh potato flowers. The qualities in terms of phosphorus and iron showed no definite trend but differed essentially from each other. Phosphorus works intimately with calcium to produce bones and teeth. It is put away in the bone as calcium phosphate. So the phosphorus uh, content of the pita bread is 7.8 grams uh, per serving, which is equivalent to 1.11% of the recommended nutrient intake. Well, for iron, it has, syrup, uh, it has 12 grams, uh, 0.12 grams per serving, which is 1% of the recommended nutrient intake. According, according to Bibiana et al. 2014, bread rich in these supplements would be able to improve the strength of both children and adults. After subjecting it for nutritional analysis, it has resulted that the pita bread with sweet potato contains 3.93 grams of iron per 100 grams. As, as I stated in the previous section, to be able to complete the suggested intake of the FNRI, which is in adults, varies from 12 to 28 milligrams per day, while pregnant and lactating women requires 30 to 38 milligrams per day, other iron-rich food must be incorporated or eaten along with the, sweet, with the pita bread with sweet potato to complete the regular intake. The direct material cost shows the different cost of the other ingredients that was used in developing the food product. It is clearly stated that the sweet potato pita bread can be sold for 92.56 pesos per pack, which contains 8 pieces of pita bread weighing 30 grams each. Other cost components, such as utilities, process of production, packaging, and others will still be further added and comparing its price with the commercially available pita bread that has a price of 110 pesos per pack. And finally, for the summary, conclusions, and recommendations, the result of the mean sensory score in accordance with the preferences of 30 panelists with regards to the following, 
Lottery or the 50% formulation had the highest mean score in terms of appearance, aroma, and texture. While for color, taste, and general acceptability, Lot 4 or the 25% formulation garnered the highest mean score. Several factors affect the sensory results since I incorporated different types of flour that contributed to the appearance, color, and taste of the samples presented. It is also shown in the study that the pita bread that, 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 that was being developed contains 1.33 milligrams and 9 milligrams of iron and calcium respectively. In order to complete this, uh, the recommended nutrient intake, other iron and cal calcium-rich foods must be added or incorporated with the pita bread. With the significant findings of the study, the hypothesis statement from Chapter 1 will now be answered that based on the several data analysis method, it was stated that there were both significant and non-significant differences among the samples depending on the sensory attributes. And the 25% formulation followed by the 50% formulation were highly acceptable in terms of general acceptability. For the recommendations, it is highly recommended to do more further studies since while I was doing this research, uh, there are very limited review-related re literature about sweet potato powder. Uh, considering other iron-rich fruit crops in incorporating with the composite flour to add up in the iron content and other nutritional nutrients in the pita bread. Next is to subject the pita bread in other nutrient laboratory analysis. And lastly, for further studies that will require more panelists to have a wider range of perspective in the products presented. So the following slides will be the references. To everyone who registered and joined us for today, maraming salamat, salamat sa tanan, daghang salamat, Terimakasi, bedang, and thank you for listening. I hope you gained knowledge and interest on my topic. That's all. All right. So thank you, Ms. Audi, for that interesting presentation. So now we have come to our question and answer session. For questions regarding the presentation, please type it on the comment box, and Ms. Audi will try to answer them all. Okay, and while we are waiting for the questions, we would like to acknowledge Ms. KSLM and Ms. Emma Concepcion, Ms. Arniel Jane Cabanigan, and Ms. Shainadin Bakor, who is watching. Thank you very much for participating. We would also like to mention some of our participants who are active on our comment box. We would like to mention Mr. Mark Edsel Cuevas, Ms. Carvina Ann Navarro, and Ms. Danica Madrial and Ms. Jean Rose Kabiling. Thank you very much for watching. So, um, Ms. Ali, are you ready for uh, your questions? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so for your first question, why did you choose sweet potato as the main ingredient in the pita bread? Oh, so thank you for the first question. Um, since sweet potato, since sweet potato is widely grown here in our country, and most of them were used in household, uh, aside from doing it for, for a living, uh, uh, it is uh, it also contains high amount of vitamins and minerals, and it has a lot of of uh, it has a lot of usage, and it is flexible in any other forms, such as powder, puree, or flour that can be combined with any other food products that will add up to its nutrient. And uh, it is widely available here in our country. It would it would be it wouldn't be hard for me to look for. Uh, a raw materials to be able to produce this product. That's very well said, Miss Ali. Thank you very much. Now, for our next question, aside from the Philippines, what other countries use sweet potato as an additional to composite flour? Uh, now, to answer your question, uh, sweet potato is cultivated and utilized extensively in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, although processed products uh, are more common in countries like our country, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam, uh, several countries also use uh, use sweet potato in any other forms, which is which is in Israel, Peru, Caribbean. 
Uh, so their main product usually is in bread. So they substitute uh, different flours with sweet potato flour to be able to produce the bread because as other studies uh, uh, believe and uh, other studies supported that uh, replacing sweet uh, replacing flours with sweet potato flour contributed to its nutrient content. So uh, some countries uh, 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 some countries uh, know that this will help aid the uh, the nutri nutritional problems in their countries. Okay, thank you for your answer, Ms. Ellen. Now, for your last question, what other root crops can be added to composite flour to be able to supply the lacking nutrients of the product? Okay, so for them, for my third answer, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, there are a lot of root crops that that was that was being utilized not just here, here in the Philippines but also in the whole world but based on several studies that I've read while doing this research some developing countries use as banana soybean cassava ube taro and also other vegetables such as carrot squash malunggay and etc uh, they tend to uh, dry and powder this and mix it with com composite flour to be able to produce different bread or food products that will sustain them. So that's all. Once again, thank you very much, Miss Ali. And thank you to our 50 participants for all your inputs to the discussion. And I hope that Miss Ali answered your questions. Now, if we were not able to answer your questions due to time limitations, you may still send them to her official email address, 2018. T0728 at pwu.edu.ph. And Ms. Ali and our team will answer your questions to the best of our abilities. All right, so a quick reminder to all please be advised that the evaluation form will be posted 20 minutes before the end of our session. So only registered participants will be eligible to receive an e certificate upon completion of the evaluation form after this session. So your responses in the evaluation form are very much appreciated and will be used for further improvements of our future webinars. And also take note that we will be accepting your evaluation form only until 6 p.m. All right, so for our next topic is all about Nutrilicious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips, Ipumea Batata. Wow, the second topic is very interesting, Miss Alexa. Yes, so that is why we need to listen very carefully for this informative topic. And to start with the second speaker, she's a graduating student under the bachelor's program in food science and technology. She is also the secretary of PATH Delta chapter in PWU. Her research study will show how much she values and loves her passion as a food technologist. Dear participants, one of the pride of Team BSFP, let us all welcome Ms. Angela Gaho in her topic, Nutritious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips, Epomea Batatas. Ms. Angela? All right, so while we're waiting for Ms. Angela, we would also like to welcome um, Ms. Nicole Rustic for watching us right now. Welcome to our webinar. And also Ms. Alpha Maribay, welcome to our webinar. We would also like to uh, mention Mr. Cian Madrazo, Ms. Nicole Rustic, Ms. Alpha Yodia Maribay. Thank you very much for participating. Yes, welcome to our webinar. Hello, Ms. Angela. Hello. Yes. Um, can you see my slides now? All right. So I think Ms. Angela is having a technical problem right now. So while we're waiting for Ms. Angela, we would like to welcome our participants right now. So welcome to our webinar, Mr. Mark Edsel Cuevas. And also Ms. Jean Rose Cabelli. And also Ms. Emma Concepcion. All right, I think Ms. Angela is now ready to present her topic. 
Good afternoon, everyone. So for today, I will be giving you an insight about my research study entitled The Nutritious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips or the Ipomea Batatas. So for this uh, chapter, um, it aims to gather the crucial informations that are important for the study. So the yellow flesh is the Now, while we are still waiting for Miss Angela, again, we would like to say hi to Miss Alpha Yodia Maribai and Miss Lizelle Polioso Valiente. Thank you very much to those who are very active on our comment box. Yes, also. And again, we would like to welcome our new participants. Uh, hello, Maylene Gastado. Welcome to our um, webinar. And also, Miss uh, Lizelle Poloso Valiente. Welcome. I hope you guys uh, enjoy our webinar for today. So, yes, and if you'd like to be mentioned, um, just like on our other participants, you could um, mention or comment on our comment box, um, and you can also include the name of your company or office or the name of your university. Yes, that's right. Hello, sorry for the delay. Um, can you see my slides now? Hello, Ms. Angela. Yes, uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, you can see now your slides, Ms. Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. So for today, I will be giving you an insight about my research study entitled the Nutritious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips, or the Ipomea Batatas. Hello, Miss Angela. Hello, Miss Angela. While we are trying to resolve the technical difficulty Miss Angela is experiencing, we are, we are um, going to continue um, mentioning our active participants. Um, we would like to say hi to, Miss, to Mr. Cyril Mariano. Hello, Cyril. Thank you very much. And to Miss Bea Patricia Camille Valdez, who is saying hello from TUP. Thank you very much for watching and participating. Yes, sir. And also to Miss Kimberly Almodwella, welcome to our webinar. And also from Miss Roxy Galor, hello, welcome to our webinar also. Yes, please keep your mentions or your shout outs coming and also your questions for the presentation after and we will try our best to answer them all. Yes, that's right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So for today, I will be giving you an insight about my research study entitled The Nutritious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips or the Ipomea Batatas. So for this uh, chapter, um, it aims to gather the crucial informations that are important for the study. So the yellow flesh is the most nutritious among the three varieties of the sweet potatoes. The, natu the natural uh, root crop is nutritious and improves one's health and is known to be rich in beta-carotene, vitamin B6, manganese, and potassium. So according to Shoebrooks of 2019, this root crop is also known to improve the blood sugar regulations and also have an anti-inflammatory nutrients. 
So this root crop is locally produced in the Bicol region, Western and Eastern Visayas, according to PSA 2020. It is also mentioned earlier by the first speaker. Um, the sweet potatoes has a 3.8% of fruit production from January to March 2020, where the total of 4.23 thousand metric tons um, has an increase from the same quarter in 2019. The Bicol region have the highest production rate of 2.14% of the total output of the quarter. The Western Visayans ranking second with the 12.1% and the Eastern Visayas in third place with 11.8 shares of the total quarter. So from 2015, there was a 3.9% national prevalence of underweight at the age of five, where uh, there was a 5% decrease rate from 2013. The objective of the study is to present a new innovation for the root crop as a ready-to-eat snack that could help create a diversity of food products. Next, we have um, the, st the statement of the problem. This study is sought to answer the following questions. What is the acceptability of the developed sweet potato snack chips? Is there a significant difference between and among the snack chips subjected to four deep frying time and the temperature in terms of their sensory attributes? Next, what is the theoretical nutrient content of the most acceptable sweet potato chips? And last but not the least is the um, question, what is the direct material cost of the most acceptable snack chips? So for the hypothesis, we have the null hypothesis here, saying that there is no significant difference between and among the sweet potato chip samples in terms of their sensory attributes. For the significance of the study, these are the groups that will benefit from the study. The farmers, where if there is a high demand for the sweet potatoes, they will also profit and help the growth of the economy of the country. Next, we have the food researchers. This paper could help um, pique their interest in creating more ways to innovate the nutritious crop in different uh, food products with the help of the current technology to solve the market needs. Next, we have the entrepreneurs. Since the root crops could be produced locally, it would, uh, it would open a new path for the entrepreneurs to a range of different scales of businesses as well as investment. And then we have the students, where this paper could help in terms of their research and stimulating new innovation, not only for the root crop, but also for other food products that could drive the trend in the future. Next, we have the scope and limitation. So this study is limited only to the following. The use of yellow flesh put sweet potato in developing the snack chips. Production was only on a laboratory scale. The frying time was the variable. In the ranking of four preference tests, there is only 50 participants that participated due to the restriction imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, the peel uh, turners were used and the shelf life and packaging studies were not included due to time constraints. So for this uh, chapter, we will tackle the other lit related literatures that will support the study. So the yellow variety of the sweet potato have the lowest starch ranging from 45.8% to 53.1% and the highest soluble sugars that is ranging from 28.9% to 31.5%. So for the market and demand, we have three topics here, which are the healthy diet, plant-based meat alternatives, and the environmental sustainability. So with the current trend of the food consumption and environmental changes, the food security and the food sustainability are on a collision course that will need an extreme downward shift in the meat and dairy consumptions. 
the market and the consumers are now more interested in the healthy diet and plant-based food products as an alternative which are both good for health and the environment. As for our related food products, some of the products were launched recently under the plant-based banner, such as the FNRI extruded sweet potato, that was another nutritious alternative to french fries, the also healthy mango sweet potato banana, that is a mixture of fruit puree turned into chips, and last but not the least is the San Miguel Corporation's Viga with a variety of far five variants of meat-free uh, balls, the burger patties, sausages, guineling, and nuggets that are fully cooked and seasoned. So the next slide is about the calcium deficiency. So the mean energy intake um, were around 19 to 35% lower than the estimated energy requirement. It shows that there was a high prevalence of inadequate intakes that were found most um, for macro and micronutrients. Where this prevalence of inadequacies have the percentage of 92 to 94% for the calcium. There is also um, a significantly low level of calcium for the critical cases of COVID-19 than the mild cases and cases in early stages of the COVID-19 cases. The calcium is closely associated with the virus-associated multiple organ injuries and the increase of the inflammatory cytokines. This is according to Langwan et al. of 2020. So one of the goals of this paper is to find out if it can address the calcium deficiencies of the COVID-19. It will then um, be further addressed by our last speaker, so stay tuned. Next, we have the theoretical framework. The theoretical framework tackles four main aspects, such as the food technology, where this focuses on the product's texture preference and the taste and flavor. The nutrition and health that is related to the nutrients in the product and its product groups, which is under the snack products. Next, we have the legislation, where the labeling and nutrition goes hand in hand here for the nutrients found in the product. And last but not the least is the consumer perspective where using the consumer-like preference is to find the most acceptable product of the as well as the direct uh, material cost of the most acceptable product. So next we have here is the research paradigm with the IPO model. So for the input, we have here the healthy benefits found in the sweet potato chips the nutrients in the yellow sweet potato chips, availability of the crop in the Philippines, as well as the rennie for the school children. For the process, it is um, the frying time and temperature, the sensory evaluation, that is the ranking test and hedonic test, and then the direct material cost for the most acceptable snack chips. And for the output, we have the healthy delicious natural sweet potato, chips in crinkle cuts. So for this next chapter, it will tackle the four pieces of the uh, study. Here we have the flow chart for the um, sweet potato chips, where we will start first with the raw materials, that is the yellow variety of the sweet potato, then going to weighing, washing, peeling, then weighing again, slicing, soaking, then drying, deep frying, the de oiling, packaging, until we got our finished product that is the sweet potato chips. So for the preliminary studies, um, it is conducted using the ranking test to identify the significant differences between and among the four samples. And these samples are coded samples A, B, C, and D. 
next for the phase two of the product development of the sweet potato chips, we have the sensor evaluation, where the final sensor evaluation used was the hedonic test. The seven point hedonic scale for the sensory attributes and nine point hedonic scale for the general acceptability. So according to a study, a mean liking score of seven or higher than on a nine point scale is usually indicative of a high acceptable sensory quality. Therefore, the product is achieving the score um, could have a good illustration of the target quality according to Everett 2009. So for the statistical analysis, the results were interpreted with the Kramer's test of 95% and 99% and the t-test for ranking test and hedonic test respectively. Next, we have the theoretical nutrient computation um, where the formula for the TNC is the value of the nutrient multiplied by the grams per serving divided by 100 grams is equals to the TNC value. And for the formula for the Rennie requirement, it is the TNC value divided by the Rennie requirement multiplied by 100 is equals to the percentage Rennie. Next, we have the laboratory analysis where the most acceptable product was subjected to the calcium content analysis at the FNRI San Fernando, Pampanga City, where there is a 500 grams of the product that was packed and then sealed for the analysis. The method of analysis that was used was the analytical method of modified AOAC. So for the direct material costs, uh, this phase aimed to determine the actual cost of the product based on the price of the raw materials or the existing retail prices at the time of the study. So we have here the yellow sweet potato. So this yellow variety is very nutritious, as I said earlier. And then um, there is no sweetener, no sodium or flavorings that is used in this product. Next, we have the coconut oil, where the use of coconut oil for frying as a medium have a few benefits. It is, it is to lower the cholesterol levels, according to Navan and Raham Mohan of 2004. It also have anti-inflammatory effects with its bioactive compounds that is most commonly found in the virgin coconut oil and fermented virgin coconut oil, according to Biosac et al. of 2014. So this alternative is uh, for the trans fat oils that is used in the food industry for some of the chips production. Although um, it is cheap and its melting point is at the room temperature and very helpful for the food industry, according to the researchers uh, Valentina Remig, Barry Franklin et al. of April 2010, they stated that there are um, there is an epidemiological myologic and biochemical evidence that the trans fat in the excessive amount of um, amounts in the diet could potentially lead to a percentage of 23 percent increase in the cardiovascular risk then we have the result um, which is the product of the sweet potato chips So next chapter would be about the presentation, analysis, and interpretations of the finding where um, all data gathered are presented in tables and analyzed to answer the problem stated from the previous part of the study. So for the phase one, the preliminary study, the four samples are in different between the time of five seconds to one minute at a specific temperature. The ranking test with 50 panelists, ages 13 to 50 years old, was asked to rank the products based on their preferences. And then the result shows a significant difference that existed um, among the four samples. A second ranking test was done to determine the two most acceptable samples that would be subjected to the hedonic test. 
So we have here the weighted mean of Kramer's test, 95% and 99%. So in this part, we have the sample codes of the products and then the mean where uh, the least number shows the most acceptable or the most like of their the panelist preference and the highest uh, number shows the least like. So um, in the third and fourth table or column, um, there shows a parenthesis where this number involves that there is no significant differences between the samples. So our interpretation for this two um, percentage, there is a significant difference between and among the samples. So this is the images of the four deep fried sweet potato chips. Then we have here the weighted mean for the hedonic test. So um, we have the two most acceptable product, which is the sample C and sample D. And although the interpretations are mostly similar, um, if we look at the general acceptability, it shows that uh, the sample D is with the number of 7.88 that is interpreted as like very much, while in comparison to sample D, it is only with 6.4 that is interpreted with like slightly. So if we look at the study again from Everett of 2009, it is most likely that the sample D would be the most acceptable food product or the sam uh, most acceptable product in the study. So here are the images of the two most acceptable food product. For the t-test result, so the sample shows that the t-computed is greater than the t-tabulated at the 5% level of significance. Therefore, the interpretation is significant and the decision is to accept the alternative hypothesis where there is a significant difference between the two samples. Next, we have here the theoretical nutrient computation table. So in this first part, we have the nutrients. This is according to the FNRI 1997. And um, the nutrients here are the most significant nutrients in the yellow variety. The next column is about the TNC that is subjected to 500, uh, 50 grams, 50 grams of the food product. Then we have the age difference, uh, which is around six to nine for the school children. Then the RENE requirement per day for both male and female. And the last column is about the percentage RENE that is satisfied by one serving of the most acceptable sweet potato chip sample. So for the males, um, the calcium would be around 2.14% of the RENE satisfied. Vitamin A is 16.91%. Ascorbic acid is 15.56%, dietary fiber is 17.27%, and the carbohydrates of 30.7%. Next here, we have the laboratory analysis for the calcium content. So the result shows that the laboratory chemical analysis for the calcium content is around 0.02% of the yellow sweet potato chips. And the study um, wanted to find out if the snack chip could help with the indication of lack of calcium for the COVID-19 patients. And from this result, it is concluded that the product cannot address the calcium level that is needed from the COVID-19 patients, according to the study of Lung One at all of 2020. So next is for the phase for the direct material cost. So this table shows that the cost per serving is around 13.64 pesos per 50 grams. And the costing is only for the direct material cost. Therefore, the indirect costs such as the utilities, indirect materials, etc., should be considered. 
we have here now the last and final chapter of the study, the chapter 5, where this chapter provides the summary of the findings, conclusions, and recommendations based on the results presented and analyzed in the previous chapter. So we have here the percentage Rennie of inadequate level that would be supplied by other food products. So there is a 66% uh, level of inadequate Rennie for carbohydrates, 83.83% uh, 83 for dietary fiber, 84% in ascorbic acid, 92% for vitamin A, and 98% for calcium. It is taste it is stated by uh, Suhan Shu et al. of 2020 that the change such as color, texture, moisture, and oil uptake of the food were due to the influence of the heat, mass, and momentum transfers during the frying process. The frying time is short and there is an insolubility of the water-soluble vitamins. Therefore, less deterioration is expected to the heat-sensitive vitamins according to Boscuo et al. 2010. So therefore, it justifies that the sample D uh, frying time is the most acceptable between the four or among the four. Next, we have the conclusion. The yellow flesh sweet potato is a good raw material in producing an afford affordable, highly acceptable and nutritious uh, snack chips. The sample D is deep fried for 50 seconds at a temperature of 190 degrees Celsius and was the most acceptable snack chips made out of yellow flesh sweet potato. Then we have the four snack chips samples were significantly different in terms of their sensory attributes. Therefore, the null hypothesis is rejected. Then we have the recommendation where the following are hereby recommended. First is to replicate the study using unpeeled sweet potatoes, uh, sweet potato tubers to optimize the dietary fiber and other micronutrient contents in the peels. Next is to conduct the further studies as follows. Um, the shelf life of study of the sweet potato snack chips. Determination of the appropriate packaging material for the developed sweet potato snack chips, a packaging study. A pilot study production to assess the viability of the product. Then um, we have the use of other varieties of the sweet potato, as well as the other indigenous tubers in the development of other variants of the snack chips. So that is all. Thank you for listening and I hope that you Okay, and uh, thank you, Miss Angela. That was a very informative presentation and I hope we all took the advantage of absorbing these details. We will now proceed with our five minute question and answer session. For questions regarding the discussion, please type it in the comment box and Miss Angela will try to answer your questions. All right, thank you, Miss Joanna. So questions are coming in. Are you ready, Miss Angela? Yes, I am. Let's right, get it rolling. For our first question, what is the possible edge and advantage of purchasing your potato chips compared to the other chips in the market? Okay, so for that first question, um, the possible advantages of this uh, product against or compared to the um, available uh, uh, potato chips in our market is that first, in terms of nutrients, uh, this specific variety of sweet potato has a lot of, uh, a lot of minerals and vitamins. And then aside from that, the production of these um, chips is low cost and all natural, as well as it doesn't need any specific artificial uh, um, additives or flavors.
I think Miss yes, Alexa, Alexa is on mute. Okay, hello. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. So for our second question, Miss Angela, how will you compare the nutritional content of commercially available chips versus the sweet potato chips? Yes. Um, so for our second question, um, we should be looking for the food composition of um, this specific food products. So uh, I look at the um, nutrient content of the sweet, uh, yellow variety of sweet potato from the um, PDRI 2015. And then um, if we compare it to the nutrient content of the potato chips available in the market, um, it will be varying because of the different ingredients that will be used in uh, in those products. Yes. All right. Thank you. And before we finally end the session, you just need to answer one more question, Miss Angela. What advice can you give to someone who is interested in pursuing the product as um, possible food venture? Yes. Um. So for this. A last question. Um, to create this specific uh, chips, sweet potato chips, into um, the business industry or the food industry, is firstly we have to do a pilot study first and then um, validating the results and the packaging as well as the shelf life study of the um, research because um, it is not. Uh, it is not available in this um, thesis paper, as well as um, we should look forward to um, the possible uh, disadvantages or problems or issues, such as the uniformity of the chips and um, along with its size, shapes, and then the variety that they wanted to use. That is all. All right, thank you, Ms. Angela, for that enlightening session. And thank you to our participants for your um, inputs. If we were not be able to answer your questions due to time limitation, you may still send them to her official email address. It will be 2018 p0170 at pw.edu.ph. And Ms. Angela and our team will answer your questions to the best of our abilities. Ms. Joanna? Yes, and before we proceed with our third speaker, we would like to say hi to some of our participants. We would like to say hi to Miss Lara Isabel Escobar, and we have several participants as well from USLS Pakodad. We would like to say, to say hi to Miss Roxy Jalor, Miss Femme Cabro Diaz, Miss Antoinette Palmes, Miss Madeline Arimado. Thank you very much for watching, and we also have Mr. Aris Vincent Torres from Colegio de Calumpit and Ms. Madeline Armada from CBS UA and hello as well to Jalil Marasigan from Cavite. Also to Mr. Melbourne Levon from Negro State College of Science and Technology. Wow, that was wow. a little bit far from Sagay City, Negros Occidental, Mr. Melbourne. Thank you very much for your support. Also, we have Miss Cristel Ato from TUP Manila. Hello, Cristel. We also have Miss Fesheya Beja or Beja, and hello to Miss Jane, Jane Marie Salas. And um, please keep your questions and comments coming in for our next presentation. And of course, we would like to acknowledge Miss Kimberly Almuela, Miss. And also, uh, Ms. Melaine Octubre and Christy Asotige, Mr. Mark Robel Claro, and Sheila May Magbanwa. Um, they sent a card to us. Thank you for your support. Thank you for watching our webinar. And um, also, we would like to mention uh, Ms. Margot Garingan, Ms. Raquel Punsay, and Ms. Joyce Rayala, the compliance team of Philippine Airlines. Thank you very much. And lastly, we would like to mention Hazel Sianco, Olin Tinonas, Ms. Kyla Christian Madon, and Jessiel Bacos. Once again, thank you guys for keeping our comment box active. Hello. Now, mm -hmm. yes, and now um, let, let us proceed for our next talking point. This is about Ube Yos Korea Alata chips. Growth is found in your roots. What a fascinating topic 
to discuss. To welcome our third speaker, he's also a graduating student of BS Food Science and Technology. He is the treasurer of PATH Delta chapter as well, and his exploration about this amazing root crop will provide us insights and appreciate the important roles of being a food technologist. We would like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Mark Suyat. So good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and everyone who is listening right now. And the topic for my research and the product that I have been developing is entitled Ubi Chips, Growth is Found in Your Roots. So now let's begin to our first chapter, chapter one. So you may ask, why did I develop this? So to simply answer that, I wanted a product, specifically a snack product, that is both convenient and comforting to us Filipinos, while still being nutritious and a bit unconventional than what we're used to. So as for the rest of, our, of the world, a product that's from the Philippines, like a trademark, that when you hear this product, you would immediately associate it as a product of the Philippines. So which brings me to my first point, Ube can be local and national demand. So why do I say this? Because first, ube is everywhere, everywhere here in the Philippines. It is a locally grown crop. Basically, the, film, the sense of familiarity is there. Secondly, internationally speaking, it is now gaining recognition in numerous countries, such as the US and Japan, uh, in, man, in many Western Filipino foods. And by 2005, it is now considered by the Department of Trade as the Philippines export banner crops. So moving on to the statement of the problem. So this research have four problems that need to be addressed and specifically aims to achieve First, does barring frying time affect the ability of ubi chips in terms of all quality attributes? Second, is there any significance between and among those quality attributes? Third, what is the nutritional value of the most ubi chip? what is the direct material cost of the most acceptable food chip. So next is our hypothesis. So the hypothesis for this research is ube has significant difference in terms of its sensory attribute and consumer preference to replace potato as an ingredient in most chips. So moving on to the significance of this study. So this study pertains to five sectors and is for the betterment of these sectors. So in my case, I wanted to pursue ubi chips because I believe when this product sells, it would give, first of all, to farmers. It is for farmers who are the backbone of the agricultural sector to be able to produce and deliver crops, which ultimately raise their profit and job security. Furthermore, pushing new concepts such as ubi chips would urge, man would urge manufacturers to supply more products and encourage competitive pricing in, in terms of the snack industry. Thirdly, researchers and students alike can utilize the data given in this study to gain more understanding on the matter, such as, it, such as the harvesting of ube, processing of it, and it will serve the, as a reference for their own future studies. Lastly, the consumers. So the, the target audience for this product is, of course, Filipinos. So Filipinos, the consumers, can enjoy a new type of variety of a product that separates itself from the rest of the conventional snack chips or mostly potato chips. So this study is basically uh, done through product formulation and testing of samples through frying that under one specific cooking temperature and different time interval for standardization. So keep in mind, this is the variable of this study. Second is the determination of nutrients present is based on theoretical computation and nutrient laboratory analysis. So as for the limitation of this study, due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, and this research was no exception, we had to institute safety measures that limit the number of participants, especially in the sensory evaluation, which is usually in sensory evaluation, uh, 50 people are uh, engaged or in the sensory evaluation, but we had to reduce it to 10 to 20 people. There were also delays for third-party laboratory analysis. So next chapter. So for a little background as to why kinampai, or I decided why ube or purple yam. So the main focus of the study is the variety of ube known as kinampai. 
So according to a study by An Yan Wu and Ildefonso, 2015, and another one by Slow Food Foundation in 2018, ubi kinampay originated in the island of Bohol, where it is known for its purple pigment. So yeah, no wonder uh, another name for it, or we locally call it purple yam. So it's described as an irregular shape and rough skin type of tuber. We established that, yes, it is a locally grown crop and very unique and distinguishable because of its purple color. So by this description, now let's find out the market and the demand for this purple yam. So as I mentioned a while ago, why I think this crop can meet the local international demand because aside from its unique qualities that gives itself some distinction from its tuber family, like the conventional potato chips, so it is considered the queen of, uh, queen of yams. It is, quite, and it is quite versatile in nature. So yet most of us think it can only be used in bakery ingredients, bakery applications, like syrups, puree, or in dehydrated form or powdered form. But since there's a massive appeal for bakery ingredients or and baking, here in the Philippines, uh, ube can ride that demand. So since we are a developing country with a growing population, giving the people an option to another variety of snack product will be very, be will be very beneficial to us consumers. So next is the frying and production of chips. So since our product is also a fried product like all snack foods, like its potato counterpart, the main cooking method of it is frying. So this literature serves as our basis to the methodology or cooking method done to our chip product. So moving on to the nutrient deficiencies and the nutrient retention of ube. So this product, ube, can not only appeal for its taste and other qualities, it also contains high nutritional value that can answer to many of nutrient deficiency present in our community, especially here in the Philippines. So in most chip products, usually the nutrition of that is fairly absent. So according to this, Filipino diets consist of highly processed food that serve little to no nutrient value. So basically, our body is not benefiting to it. And Filipinos do have nutrient deficiencies. As stated, the lack of these nutrients in terms of iron, fiber. So the lack of these nutrients, which our product could provide. And this article proves that ube, the tuber, retains the nutrients and can provide the iron, fiber, and as well as zinc and calcium in our diet. So moving on to hedonic scale. So to evaluate how good of a product our ube chip is, I use one of the popular methods of assessment in sensory evaluation, which is called a hedonic scale. So you may ask, what is a hedonic scale? So as defined by Margaret Everett, Hedonic scale are a measurement tool designed to capture the extent of a subject's preference in a like-dislike spectrum. So it is used for sensory evaluation to measure product's acceptability in a given market. So basically, for a product to be considered acceptable or papatok ba to sa market, it should, be an, it should have at least a six average score in a seven-point hedonic scale while, in, well, while scoring a seven above for the nine-point hedonic scale. So moving on to our theoretical framework. So the figure serves as a support of my research that tackles nutrition and health, legislation, consumer perspective, and food technology. The study encompasses the food industry as a whole and its responsibility in establishing knowledge and behaviors around nutrients, deficiencies, and health benefits, as well as discuss the potential of ubi chips in the market in terms of consumer preference and acceptability. This is done through this research product formulation, and R&D. And as for the research paradigm, the research study delves into the, delves into the problem by means of intensive scientific research, product formulation, data collection analysis, and lastly, interpretation of its results. So the variable to be studied and indicated during, it, during the preliminary test was a different frying time with a fixed temperature. So in the, prelim in, the preliminary test, uh, in the preliminary study, sensor evaluation is used as the main data collection method and for the assessment of the given product, specifically by the use of ranking and hedonic scale tests. So ranking tests was interpreted through 95 and 99% framers test 
while hedonics is utilized to appraise both sensory attributes and general acceptability of the product. So moving on to our IPO model or input process output. So this, the flow of the research starts from health benefits, from researching the health benefits of ube. Second is the processing of the chips. Third, research on its sourcing and availability of raw materials, such as nutritional content and harvesting patterns. As for the process, formulation of ube chips was done, sensor evaluation, and nutrient analysis was conducted, as well as direct material cost of it. So doing so, uh, we have garnered the most acceptable ube chip. So to finish off chapter two, let's now proceed to the methodology of this study. So the pro in the production process, it was done through a kitchen or laboratory setting. So first, we start off with the dough preparation. So I, the ingredients I used to make were ube powder or dehydrated ube, cornstarch water, and many other ingredients that were mixed in a bowl to form an ube dough. Then it was needed to strengthen to mix the ingredients thoroughly. We will know if it's done, if it's achieved its appropriate thickness, malleability, and gum-like elasticity. So afterwards, we place the ube dough to a pasta roller, or this is the stage of the chip formation. So as it goes through the pasta roller, it will achieve the right thickness that we need. Then after uh, achieving the right thickness, we cut in triangular pieces. So next stage of the production process is frying. So it starts with a purple ube dough, then it was separated in batches with different frying time. So this, this is the variable of our study, the different frying time of 11 seconds, 13 seconds, and 15 seconds, all under one specific temp, which is 180 degrees Celsius. And after that, it produces ube chips. So next, moving on to sensor evaluation. So this is a standard procedure that we made an evaluation form where for we're in four samples, which four samples, which is the first sample is the controlled sample, and this is the controlled sample containing potato, and the remaining three are ube chips with the different frying time, as I said, 11, 13, and 15 seconds. So selected participants were then asked to evaluate the four chip samples according to six categories: appearance, color, texture, aroma, taste, and the general acceptability. So now let's find out how to compute the direct material cost of these ube chips. So the, the DMC requires a long list of tables and numbers that will factor in the direct and indirect cost of the process of ube chips. But to summarize, the ingredients were computed according to its quantity in the formulation and in terms of retail price of the commodity during the time of the study. So therefore, the formulation done in the DMC is cost of raw materials plus its production equates to the direct material cost of the ube chip. Now moving on to the methodology done in nutrient content. As for how, how I was able to deduce that ube chip is high in vitamins and mineral, it was subjected to laboratory analysis. And it was determined that these three uh, nutrients, iron, calcium, and dietary fiber, is abundant in ube. And it's subjected to a laboratory analysis. As you can see, 300 gram samples were packed and sealed, then it was shipped to a lab in Makati, which were then subjected for laborat laboratory testing of its iron and dietary fiber co content. Specifically, absorption spectrophotometry was used to uh, test its iron and calcium content and enzymatic gravimetric method for the dietary fiber. So moving on to our next chapter. So let's discuss the product profile of the ube chips. So the product profile was determined as it goes through the frying process and the study has deemed an acceptable chip which should have golden brown color with tiny purple specks. Second, an acceptable crunchy texture Third, uniform surface, free from excessive brown pigmentation. Fourth, not to be excessively oily. Fifth, not to be rancid or bitter or have any other objectionable odors and taste. 
So now for the results of our sensory evaluation. So I, the research can say it was a success and ANOVA and DMRT was the statistical method used to interpret the, these results and it was conclusive that the UBI chips garnered acceptable ratings. The UBI chips throughout the uh, sensor evaluation scored an average rating of 6 to 8, which tells us this is highly acceptable. Why? Because once again, it is supported by studies and researchers done by Margaret Everett, which states that having a score of, above, of 7 above will result to high quality acceptability, or simply say, papatok talaga to sa market. So with that, the study can conclude the sample or the most acceptable UBI chip is the UBI with a frying time of 13 seconds. And as for the costing result of our UBI chip, I could, the research can say that it is highly competitive. So why you ask? So apart from its appeal uh, for its quality and taste, it is very cost friendly because based on the direct material cost or its computation, the cost, uh, comparing the cost of potato and UBI, we're not that far apart. And still, it's on par with the pricing of other competitors who offer different kinds of chip products. So now, this is the laboratory results of its nutritional content. So to make it simple and direct, as you can see from the table, Ubi chips is healthy considering the result of the dietary fiber, which resulted to 9.74 grams, while the iron content of it is 0 0.38 milligrams and the calcium of it was not that significant, but still also detectable. And I have reduced the nutrients to dietary fiber and iron, which can contribute to the daily recommended intake of these nutrients. So I would like to give emphasis to the results of dietary fiber, which had, had uh, when tested, our UBE had a result of 9.74 grams. Uh, Basically, dietary fiber can contribute 40 to 45 percent of the recommended nutrient intake established by the FNRI. So, if you imagine that, if you eat, let's say, a bag of chi ubi chips, con uh, contain 100 grams in a day, you're already halfway to the suggested fiber for its iron content. So, moving on to chapter five. Now let's discuss the summary of findings. So to summarize, in the preliminary, in the preliminary test, is to compare multiple samples based on the ranking preference or attribute intensity. So in this case, in this case, it evaluated the significance of different frying time and indicated that the buying frying time was preferred. So based on the presented data for the ranking test, the acceptable frying time can range from 11 to 15 seconds, which by that information, we have determined that variables of different time intervals. So in the next finding is the product acceptability. So time and time again, I said that Ubi chip received a high remark of six or seven above average score. Results show that in terms of taste, aroma, texture, and general acceptability, there was a significant difference from the controlled sample, which is potato, to the remaining Ubi, Ubi samples or the other three. So to conclude, UBE overall was highly acceptable among those respondents in areas such as taste and texture, which is the most important uh, attributes when considering uh, chip products. So it, it has been the most prefer preferred, and this could indicate marketability and on par with the conventional potato chips in the market. So next is its high nutrient content of the UBE chips. So the lab results can attest to this statement that ubi chips yield the high percentage of dietary fiber, which is 9.74 grams and iron 0 0.38 milligrams, which was more than the study had anticipated. Therefore, ubi as snack product then has nutritional value that can aid the deficiency of nutrients discussed. And as for dietary fiber, which is significant uh, in this study, comes with health benefits such as for healthy digestion and slowing down the absorption of glucose into our bloodstream, which can help regulate our sugar level. So this will benefit uh, our, our fellow Filipinos, mostly mga diabetics. And lastly, it's competitive pricing. Not only its content and nutritional value, it has, but also pricing. Ubi is, as a chip or snack product, 
it is highly competitive because based on the DMC result, the cost of Ubi chip was not that expensive than the conventional potato chip. But still, many more can be done to lower down the cost or have an acceptable costing price. So these factors uh, should uh, be applied by increasing the demand for it, marketing it, marketing it properly, and spreading it throughout. Second is encourage more ubi plantation. And last is this will help promote healthy competition to establish competitors, especially in the snack industry. Now for our conclusion. So based on the summary of findings, we can safely conclude that the study satisfies what we're looking for. And the study can concur from its hypothesis that ubi has a significant difference to potato in terms of sensory attribute and consumer preference. These are all based on the related studies, nutrient analysis, sensor evaluation. Therefore, sample 199 or the ubi chip sample fried in 13 seconds rank first in preference, which translated to being a marketable product. So these are supported by both preference tests done in preliminary and the sensory evaluation. And now lastly is the recommendation for this study. For one, conduct further study and development about this research topic because of the limitation and time restriction, especially during this time, as well as explore more factors in regards to the raw material and process. Secondly, since I limited the number of participants, there's a need for a mass focus group with diverse profiling as panelists to further evaluate the overall general acceptability of the ubi chip product. Third recommendation is to do more research on its nutrient content. Since I only tackled kinampai, or specifically kinampai, there's a need to study other varieties and the different kinds of nutrients those ubi varieties can provide. And lastly, conduct further experiments and research on the production process to further improve and standardize the product that can be applied in a manufacturing setting. So uh, this research uh, should, uh, moreover, this research should research more on its technical aspects such as pilot testing, shelf life, and packaging development. So that ends for my presentation. Hope you gain knowledge and interest on the potential of our ubi chip as a snack product. So if so, thank you for listening. All right. So thank you, Mr. Mark. That was a very enlightening presentation. And I hope our participants was able to chat down the key and educated details from Mr. Mark. So uh, before we proceed with our question and answer, I would like to welcome our participants here from Ordaneta City University, from Lillian May. Hello, and also to uh, our participants from um, Aklan, thank, uh, thank you for watching right now. And also to um, Yes, and we would also like to acknowledge Mr. Edwin Ronquillo. Hello, Edwin. To Mr. Renea Rose, Mr. RJ Dordes. Once again, good afternoon to Ms. Christine Acanto, who is watching all the way from Aklan State University, Ibajay or Ibahay Campus. Thank you very much for watching. And to Ms. Lillian Mayloki Lokiao, who is watching from Ordaneta City University. Hello, Ms. Lillian. Also, we'd like to say hi to Ms. Jezaniah Arieta. Hi, Ms. Jeza. And thank you to Ms. Gladys Sabado as well. Thank you very much for your support. And once again, please keep your questions and comments coming in. You may indicate the name of your school or your company on the comment box. Now, so let's have our question and answer portion. For your question, please kindly type it again in our in your comment box and Mr. Mark will exert his best to provide explanations with your interest. Okay, thank you very much, Miss Alexa. So uh, questions are now showing up. Are you all set, Mr. Mark? Yes, uh, I'm ready. Okay, now for uh, um, the first question, aside from the Philippines, what countries do you think Uber chips will be marketable? Um, so, uh, as doing research, uh, aside from here in the Philippines, uh, countries that I would say would gain popularity would be the U.S. 
Japan, China, because those are currently uh, uh, big on exports in terms of ube. And especially in, commu in Filipino communities with a big diaspora, especially like in the States, in California, uh, where Filipino cuisines are gaining popularity and ube is riding that wave. So I would say the US, Japan, China, and many more. All right. Now, for your second question, what is the best variety of ube for the application of ube into a snack product? So, uh, best variety, I would say still uh, the variety of kinampai that was used here in this research because still it is considered queen of ube varieties because, because, because of its purple color. Unlike other varieties found in Zambales, Leyte, um, they have white, uh, white color. So still, kinampai is uh, the number one and probably most preferred variety for the use of this application. Yeah. That's a very well said. Now, for your last question, what are the nutrients ube can provide? So as I discussed, um, nutrients, the top three nutrients that we can provide is still dietary fiber, iron, and it's iron calcium. But during their laboratory results, um, significantly dietary fiber was ranked first and could provide 40 to 45 percent of the recommended daily nutrient intake of dietary fiber. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mark, for this wonderful session. And thank you to our participants for all your inquiries. Once again, if we were not able to answer your questions due to time limitations, you may still send them to his official email address, 2018-T0117 at pwu.edu.ph. And Mr. Mark and our team will answer your questions to the best of our abilities. Ms. Alexa? All right, so those were really informative discussions. And now for our fourth speaker, it will give us more interesting discussions about the BB, which is also known as Vitex Negrudo, Well, it was widely used in folk medicine. So let me introduce our fourth speaker. She's a graduating student under the bachelor's program in food science and technology. She's also the PRO of PATH Delta chapter and her exploration about this amazing virus in the window or living bee will provide us more insights on her focus, frequency, virus in the window, and the nutrients and cancer in pesticides. Let us all welcome Ms. Carlea Duenas. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be presenting to you my paper entitled Legundi Vitex Negundolin as a Nutrient Enhancer in Testosterone. So to start, Chapter 1, we have the rationale of the study. So Legundi or Vitex Negundolin is a widely cultivated aromatic shrub distributed throughout the Philippines and other developed countries. So we all know that Legundi is very common here in our country because of its therapeutic value. So it is also widely distributed in some places here in the Philippines, such as Malikina, Quezon City, uh, Cavite, Batangas, La Unión, and other places. So short description about this plant is that all parts of this plant, from root to flower, are very useful because they can also be used in traditional medicine. Next is 80% of the world's population relies on herbal products for their primary health care needs. So this is according to World Health Organization. They stated that um, medicinal plants have provided extensive leads to combat diseases from the dawn of civilization. So since then, herbal medicines are in great demand in the developed as well as developing countries. For primary health care because of um, their wide biological and medicinal activities, um, higher, higher safety, and of course, lesser cost. Next is Vitex Negundolin is one of the 10 medicinal plants being promoted by the Department of Health. So it has been promoted due to its anti-tusive and anti-inflammatory properties. But another thing is 
one article that is according to Sturmitz F.R. et al. 2002. That Lagoon D contains chrysoplenol D, which is the bioactive substance having antihistamine and anti um, muscle relaxant properties, which makes the herb useful in treating cough, asthma, and other respiratory problems. And for the last statement, according to Santos J2020, the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration and the DOSD PCHRD, which means the Department of Science and Technology, and the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development have been approved the clinical trials for Legundi as supplemental treatment for individuals infected with COVID-19. So these agencies found out um, that this plant is very helpful in treating or preventing COVID since um, this plant is commonly known in treating cough and um, in treating cough, which is the common symptom in COVID is cough. So therefore, Lagundi is one of the approved medicines as a preventive measure in COVID-19 because the efficacy and safety of this plant have been proven through scientific research and clinical tests. So moving on to the objective of the study. Um, so um, the study generally aims the following. First is to determine the acceptability of Lagundi powder between and among the samples. Second, to determine the significance difference um, between and among the levels of Lagundi powder in terms of consumer preference. Third, to determine the nutrient content of Lagundi powder by computation and laboratory analysis. Fourth, to determine the direct material cost and um, of the most acceptable pesticide. And fifth, to determine the acceptability of pesto sauce as applied into the different uh, three different recipes, the pasta, chicken, and fish. So next is the hypothesis. So the null hypothesis states that the acceptable level of Lagundi powder and pesto sauce has no significant difference on the commercialized and controlled sample of pesto sauce in terms of consumer preference. So later we will be able to know if this had null hypothesis is being accepted or rejected. So for the significance of the study, the result is to the farmers. So for the farmers, they will be uh, benefit from this study because um, the demand on medicinal plants nowadays are high. Next is the manufacturers. So they will be able to benefit from this study because they will have the opportunity to efficiently develop and introduce new products. Next is the student. So of course, this study um, will provide them the um, uh, information about herbal or medicinal plants, specifically in Lagoon. And next is the consumers. Of course, this study may help them to widen their knowledge that might help them in their daily living. And lastly, the future researchers that will, um, this study will help them to serve as a reference for their relative studies to this research. Next is the scope and limitation. So the proposed study focused on determining the assessment of the nutritional value and health benefits of Lagoon. So the study aims to determine the acceptability of Lagoon D on pesticides through sensory evaluation. Next, this study is limited only to 50 respondents and should observe social distancing to avoid the spreading of the virus. Third, is the product undergone laboratory analysis for the determination of its nutritional content and it was handed to Qualibet last January 14, 2021. And the application of pesto sauce in different pesto recipes is limited to the evaluation of family member. Next is the chapter two. So I'll be discuss I'll be discussing some subtopics that is um, important to know. So first is medicinal plants. So according to the statement of Hassan 2012, that medicinal plants have a promising future because there are about half a million plants around the world. And Lagundi is considered as an important source of nutrition and as a result of that, this plant is recommended for its therapeutic value. So medicinal plant, 
Um, to those people who are not familiar with the look or uh, with the a look of Lagoon Deep Plan, as you can see on the illustration, um, this is the example of a Lagoon Deep Plan, which is a single thick with a stem like a trunk and leaves all permanently three to five foliage or three to five leaves. So that is why Lagoon Deep in English it is called the five leaf chase tree. So going back to the statement. Um, since the beginning of human um, civilization, medicinal plants have been used by mankind for its therapeutic value. These are the plants um, that containing inherent active ingredients um, that, is um, that can be used to cure diseases or relieve pain. And at first, we all know that it can also be used in the drug development. So medicinal plants from the Philippines have since um, made significant inroads in the global market because of the increasing demand for in organic, uh, organic and natural health products, especially in developed countries. So outside of the Philippines, preparation of medicinal plants are sometimes available at stores um, which supply herbal medicines or through practitioners of herbal and alternative medicine. So I'll give you an example. This is in Malaysia. According, um, this is according to the article of Rakaya M. et al. 2017. In Malaysia, um, the use of traditional herbal medicines in women's health, including the men's, um, regulating of um, menstrual cycle, fibrocystic breast disease, and the postpartum remedies. So postpartum means it is um, where the period immediately begins after the birth of a child. So next is the market and demand. So plant-based food, especially the medicinal plants, are expected to boost the growth of the global plant-based food market during this time. A rise in health consciousness among consumers is expected to grow global plant-based food market growth. So we all know that medicinal plants are in great demand right now, especially to the herbs that can treat cough, fever, colds and other respiratory problems. So the, med um, um, the awareness and application of plants to prepare food and medicine have been realized through trial and error, but um, gradually humans become able to meet his needs from his surrounding. Next is the calcium deficiency. So basically the um, the nutrient that I subjected into laboratory analysis is the calcium. So I need to address the persons who have calcium deficiency um, because it might help them to prevent this deficiency by the product that I develop. So brief discussion about um, calcium deficiency. It has two kinds, hypocalcemia and the hypercalcemia. Hypocalcemia is a person who lacks calcium, while hypercalcemia who um, is too much in calcium. So both deficiency can create kidney stones, and including renal failure. And one of the most common cause of inadequate calcium intake is osteoporosis when we get old. So for the first statement, this is according to the recent study of Selam B. et al. 2021. They stated that vitamin D deficiency or calcium deficiency hypocalcemia also occurs when a person is lacking vitamin D, which can be a predictor of poor prognosis in patients with COVID-19. So according to that recent review, um, basically vitamin D um, is capable in lowering the risk of COVID-19 infection. So um, vitamin D and calcium has a good relationship, which they work together to maintain our strong bones. So to support that statement, I have one article according to Romito K. 2019. He stated that our body needs vitamin D to absorb calcium. So to explain briefly about um, the relationship between vitamin D and calcium is that vitamin D has an inactive form that is innate or it is already in your skin to produce uh, which to produce the active form. So to produce that active form in our skin, we need to take sunlight, which is the primary source of vitamin D. Um, 
uh, or other food source that is rich in vitamin D like fish. Example is the salmon and tuna. So when the active form is produced, this is the time where this active form helps to regulate calcium absorption and, um, and enhance bone mobilization. So vitamin D and calcium is very important to take. Our foods that are rich in vitamin D to prevent COVID or um, to avoid other sickness. So for the second study, this is according to Zoo X et al. 2020. They investigated that some COVID-19 patients have low serum calcium levels. So in the midst of the pandemic brought by this COVID-19 virus, um, studies have been made in all aspects of the medical field um, to combat the disease. So based on the new coronavirus, pneumonia diagnosis and treatment program published by Nas National Health Commission of China stated that, that the result with the observation of that both population, which is the mild or moderate population, and the severe or critical population showed low calcium level during the early stage of the viral infection. Thus, it marked a clinical severity that indeed calcium imbalance could lower the immunity of a person causing them to be infected with diseases, especially specifically in COVID-19. So starting with the elderly, because of their low calcium absorbing, they develop osteoporosis. And also with the children, if they are low in calcium, they develop rickets. So rickets is the softening or weakening bones in children. So low calcium is not only the electrolyte imbalance caused by the viral infection, but also one of the key factors causing multi-organ injury and it judged the severity of disease in the early stage of virus. Therefore, low calcium is a new target of concern for COVID-19. So next is the theoretical framework. So this is based on the theory of Gans V.A. et al. 2018. Their theory is all about the reformulation of a food product which they stated that we need to consider these four disciplines in reformulating the product. So since the variable of my study is the different level of Lagundi powder that is um, being added to pestosos to have an unacceptable product. So my study is related to their theory because Jimenez Colmenera 2018, that reformulation will only, um, will only be will only be success, successful if reformulated foods not only to fit a healthy diet but are also of high quality and good texture, safe of course, go tasting, and of course low price. So this theoretical framework is divided into four sections which are the nutrition and health. So it includes here the nutritional content of pesto sauce with Lagundi powder. Next is the food technology. Um, it includes here the form, formulation of pesto sauce with Lagundi powder, the process, the sensory evaluation, and the application of pesto sauce, followed by the legislation. It includes here the ingredients and the allergen. And for the consumer perspective, it includes here the consumer preference. So next is the research paradigm. So this is the IPO model, which means the input, the process and the output. So this is where my idea on how to, um, how the research problem will have to be explored. So for my input, it includes here the health and benefits of Lagundi. Um, next is the efficacy of Lagundi powder. And lastly, the processing of pesto. And next is the process, where um, the process accept the inputs into the system and um, perform some method to transform it into another state. So um, under a process, it includes here the formulation of pesto sauce, um, the sensory evaluation and statistical analysis, determination of nutri nutrient content, and the direct material cost. So lastly, the output where it resulted to the most acceptable level of Lagundi powder in pesto sauce. So for the chapter three, so for the phase one preliminary study, we have here the preparation and formulation of pesto sauce. 
I know some of you are familiar with pesto sauce and it is considered one of the alternative sauce for the red sauce or we commonly know the tomato sauce. So the basic ingredients of pesto sauce are basil, nuts, olive oil, garlic, and parmesan cheese. So for my developed product where I add an ingredient that will make this pesto sauce more healthy, nutritious, and of course beneficial to us which is the lagoon bee powder. So still under phase one, so a preliminary test was conducted to determine the significant difference between and among the five samples. So in this study, we have five samples. So first is we have the lot one, which is the commercially available, followed by the lot two, as you can see on the illustration, on the left side of the picture, that is the lot 2, which is the controlled sample, followed by the lot 3, which contains 9 grams level of Lagundi. Lot 4 contains 12 grams level of Lagundi. And lot 5 contains 15 grams level of Lagundi. So this study used the ranking test method to understand and determine consumer acceptability for a certain sensory characteristic. So panelists were given the samples and allowed to try them in any, in any order so long as they rank them from least to most. So since by the time we are um, so since by that time we are still in pandemic, so we conducted this at home at Quezon City last October 4, 2020, and it was carried out by 20 respondents. So for the phase two, the process of production, we have here the sensory evaluation. So the final sensory evaluation was carried out by 50 respondents at Quezon City last December 26, 2020. So the sensory attributes that were tested were the appearance, color, aroma, texture, taste, and the overall acceptability. So still under phase two, the statistical analysis, so these are the methods that we use to analyze the data. So first is the Kramer's test, where we use the 95% and 99% Kramer's table. Next is the ANOVA, which means analysis of variance, and the Duncan's multiple range test, or the DMRD. So next is the phase three, the nutrient computation. So these are the nutrient content of Lagundi powder. So it contains calcium, which has 251.42 milligrams per 100 grams. Iron contains 16.48 milligrams per 100 grams. Phosphorus contains 185.2 milligrams per 100 grams. And fiber contains 14.6 milligrams per 100 grams. So it also includes here the formula of theoretical computation, which is the value of nutrient multiplied by the formulation over 100 is equal to theoretical nutrient computation value. So for the laboratory analysis, most acceptable sample was subjected for calcium an analysis in Qualibet. So they required 400 grams of pesto sauce and it was packed and sealed. And the analytical method that they use is the modified AUAC procedure. So for the direct material cost, the most acceptable sample or uh, formulation among the five samples were considered in this section. So it includes here all the ingredients and the direct total cost of the most acceptable pesticides was computed in purchasing the raw materials along with the cost of other components, including the packaging. So next is the phase five, the application of pesto sauce. So the formulation of pesto sauce with higher amount of Lagundi powder was being applied to the three different recipes, the pasta, chicken, and fish. So moving on to the chapter four, um, for the results of preliminary study. So in preliminary study, again, we have five samples. The lot one, the commercially available. Lot two, the controlled sample, which is without Lagundi. Lot three, which contains nine grams level of Lagundi. Lot four contains um, 12 grams of Lagundi. And lot five contains 15 grams of Lagundi. 
So again, ranking test was used to evaluate the samples and 20 respondents were gathered to evaluate and rank the samples according to their preference. So the result was interpreted through Kramer's test. So we used the 95% and the 99% um, Kramer's test table. According to Juwan's DN 2006, Kramer's test is proposed based on the rank preference of panelists also to determine if there is any significant difference on the samples. So if the samples are within the range, there is no significant difference. But if the total sum of samples are not within the range, there is a significant difference. So therefore, the result shows that there are no significant difference um, among the five samples based on consumer preference. And um, the most ranked by the panelists is the lot three, which is the nine grams level of lagoon B found. Next is the phase two, the process of production. So the same, sorry. So the same formulation as to the preliminary study were all um, were also adopted and subjected to seven point and nine point sensory evaluation which is the hedonic scale so for the result of um this sensory evaluation we use the method of ANOVA which is the ano analysis of variance and the DMRT which means the Duncan's multiple range test so for the ANOVA result the only significant difference observed were between lot one and the other four formulations are in terms of appearance, color, aroma, taste, and general acceptability, while texture resulted in not significant difference. So therefore, the attributes that showed significant difference were subjected to DMRT. So like what I said before, um, the ANOVA result only indicates if there is a significant difference between um, the five samples. But here in the DMRT, it shows if there is a significant difference between the pair of samples. Like for example, lot one versus lot two, lot two versus lot three, and so on. So based on the overall result, all pairs of samples um, shows have sensory attributes. This indicates that the different um, formulation of Lagoon D powder on pest, um, on pesto sauce did not affect the original recipe of pesto sauce. So next is the phase three, nutrient computation. So this is the nutrient computation of pesto sauce. So it includes here the pesto sauce without Lagoon D and the pesto sauce with Lagoon D. So for the calcium content, if, um, if the pesto sauce without Lagoon D, um, it contains 100 30.05 uh, milligrams per 90 grams of calcium, while if it is with Lagoon D, it contains 152.68 milligrams per 90 grams. For, um, therefore, it, um, Lagoon D was able to add 17% on calcium content. Next is the iron content. So if it is without Lagoon D, it contains 1.14 milligrams per 90 grams. And if it is with Lagoon D, it contains 2.62 um, milligrams per 90 grams. So therefore, Lagoon D was able to add 1% on iron content. And for the fiber content, if it is without Lagoon D, it contains 1.79 milligrams per 90 grams. And um, if it is with Lagoon D, it contains 1.86 milligrams per 90 grams. Therefore, Lagundi was able to add 0.03% on fiber content. And lastly, for the phosphorus content, if it is without Lagundi, it contains 66.6 .6 milligrams per 90 grams. And if it is with Lagundi, it contains 83.27 milligrams per 90 grams. So therefore, um, Lagundi was able to add 0.2% on phosphorus content. So next is the laboratory analysis result. So it shows that there is 145.52 milligrams per 100 grams on the pesto sauce with Lagundi powder. 
So the Reni of Kashum for 19 to 29 years old, both male and female, is 750 milligrams. So the nutrient content of pesto sauce, which is calcium, has a high contribution to the recommended daily intake, which has 58.20 milligrams of calcium per serving. So the percent training of this product is 7.76%. So next is the direct material cost. So after computing all the raw materials, the total cost of um, purchase at the total cost of raw materials purchased per kilogram is 274.67 pesos. And for the direct co cost per 90 grams, it um, cost 91.55 pesos. And uh, 91.55 pesos, right? And plus the packaging cost, which is 14 pesos. And for the total cost, um, it, um, with 105 pesos per 90 grams. So other cost components should be included like the utilities, um, labor, production, etc. Okay, so for the application of pesto sauce, we have three different, um, like what I said, we have three different application of pesto sauce. So dishes made with pesto sauce are rare because some people are used to the red sauce, which is the tomato sauce. So um, with this experiment, another ingredient was um, added to make it more nutritious, which is the lagundi powder. So all of these are improved dish because um, of the formulation of the pesto sauce with lagundi powder. So on the first picture, the pesto spaghetti, it is a recipe based from Joy Food Sunshine 2019 where the first serving of this pasta, it contains 32.33 milligrams of calcium. And for the second, the chicken, this is, um, name of that dish is the creamy chicken pesto. So, which is based on the recipe of Diet Food K2017, where per serving of this recipe, it contains 24.25 milligrams of calcium. And lastly, the third picture is the fish, where um, it's named as the pesto crusted fillet. So where the dish is a complete meal and it contains 64.67 milligrams of calcium. So it has mashed potato on the side, which is a carbohydrate and the fish is high in protein and the pesto crust on the top is rich in calcium. So the evaluation of these applications are limited only to the family members. So for the chapter five, we have here the summary of findings. So first is the preliminary study. So in preliminary study, based on the result, all mean scores are within the range of 95% and 99% Kramer's test table, which means there is no significant difference between the samples and the most preferred sample of the panelists is the lot three, which contains nine grams level of legundi powder. So for this final sensory evaluation, the method used is the hedonic scale to determine the acceptability of the product. So on the ANOVA result, it shows that there are significant difference in terms of appearance, color, aroma, taste, and general acceptability. And this was subjected to the MRT. Next is the I, next is for the theoretical computation. So this is based on the report of Therani DN 2016, which said Lagundi powder has cal, um, calcium content of 251.42 milligrams, iron content of 16.48 milligrams, fiber content 0.7 milligrams, and for the phosphorus content, it contains 185.2 milligrams all per 100 gram. And lastly, for the laboratory analysis, the laboratory result stated that there is 145.52 milligrams calcium per 100 grams of the pesto sauce. And for the conclusion, based on the result, I can conclude that the null hypothesis is accepted because there is no significant difference um, all, at all, uh, among all samples considering all sensory attributes. And also, um, considering the most preferred sample by the panelists, which is the lot three, 
um, contains 9 grams level of ligand B tag. So recommendation, since the result shows that there is no significant difference, therefore I would recommend to use the highest amount level of Lagoon D powder to have more contribution of the nutrient to the product. Next is to conduct a thermal processing study, pilot study, and shelf life study of pestosol. And lastly, conducting a clinical trial to further analyze the efficacy of Lagundi on the application of pesticides with the most acceptable level of Lagundi powder. So that ends my presentation. Thank you for listening and um, joining us this afternoon. God bless us all. Thank you, Ms. Carlea. That was a very informative presentation and I hope you all took the advantage of absorbing these information. Now, um, let's have our question and answer portion, but before we proceed with our Q&A, we would like to mention Ms. Cheryl Nicuda from the Department of Agriculture Regional Field Office 11 Research Division. Thank you for watching, Ms. Cheryl. And good afternoon to Ms. Angel Nicuda, watching from USTP CDO. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, of course, we would like to acknowledge Ms. Jalil Morasigan. Ms. Jalil said, nice presentation for Mr. Mark Suyat. It is very informative and detailed. On behalf of Mr. Mark, thank you, Ms. Jalil, for your positive feedback. And uh, we'd, also, uh, we'd also like to say hi to Ms. Catherine. Ms. Catherine said, all of the subject matters are all informative. Good job. And thank you for your wonderful comment. Ms. Pat. Lastly, um, good afternoon to Mr. Edwin Ronquillo, watching from Quezon City, to Ms. Angela Falcon, hi Ms. Angela, and to Ms. Kiesha and Martina Johnson, watching all the way from Antipolo City. We'd also like to say hi to Mr. Benjamin John Edades, Ms. Destiny Aitsuji, Ms. Diesel Sianco, and Ms. Jackin sent a heart to us. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for your support and thank you for watching our webinar. Now, let's have our question and answer portion for your questions. Kindly type it in the comment box and Ms. Carlea will exert her best to provide explanations with your inputs. All right, thank you, Ms. Carlea. So, questions are now showing up. Are you all set, Ms. Carlea? Yes, I'm ready. All right, that's perfect. So for our first question, why do you think medicinal plants are important in this pandemic? Okay, thank you for that question. So we all know that COVID-19 coronavirus um, has become the biggest challenge that humanity has faced at this time. It has slowed us down and deprived us of even the basic living conditions since it has already um, claim millions of lives and it's still spreading globally. We all became um, apprehensive about the disease that we got um, disciplined with so many do's and don'ts in this pandemic time. Suddenly our health it, um, becomes our priority. So um, we need to take vitamins and other supplements to keep us healthy. But some people turn to alternatives like this, medicinal plants, um, to support our um us in our health quest so uh western and conventional medicine in our country so traditional medicine has especially gained new significance in the midst of um the covid 19 the end of the pandemic appears to be in sight with the, uh, in the development of vaccine, the procurement, storage, and the, the distribution of vaccine across and within the countries will um, this take considerable time and resources. So um, I just want to add, aside from Lagundi, um, there are still other medicinal plants that have been conducted to be a preventive measure, such as the Tawa Tawa and the virgin coconut oil. So that's 
Alright, that was very well said. For our second question, aside from the BD, what other medicinal plants that can be applied to food? Okay, so thank you again for that question. So, other medicinal plants that can be applied to foods, such as the moringa or the malungay, um, that, that has been also praised for its health benefits. And many studies has been conducted to um, that this plant can fortify some food because it also contains many nutrients and antioxidants. That's why free radicals that can cause oxidative stress and um, cellular damage. So other medicinal plants or herbs like oregano, uh, rosemary, thyme, chives, uh, turmeric, per peppermint that can be used in seasoning. So that can add a pleasant aroma and taste to the food. All right, thank you. And for our last question, so what inspires you to conduct this study, Ms. Carlea? Okay, so thank you again for that question. So first of all, I was amazed to um, when I took the course of food technology. So my dream really was um, to have a restaurant business where I can try and sell my own creative fusion of different kinds of food that is found from some countries abroad. And that inspired me. So I just thought that food technology um, would also mean learning some international cuisine as done in culinary school. But the course has taught me as um, taught me more than just to cook a delectable food. As I get to study it further, it is interesting to know about the preparation, the processing, um, the, the preservation, and also the distribution of the food product. More importantly, it focuses also on how to ensure safety, preparation of the food, and better use of nutrients to make a, um, wholesome food. So all in all, it is a good career choice. To obtain a degree in food technology um, would mean to become a researcher or a scientist that relies on technology and science to develop new products, improve food system, and to protect the integrity and safety of the global food supply chain. Alright, that was very well said, Dr. And thank you for this wonderful session. And also, thank you to our participants for your all interviews. So, if you were not be able to answer your questions due to time limitation, you may still send them to her official email address, and it will be 2018 P0142 at pw.edu.ph. And Ms. Carlea and our team will answer your questions to the best of our ability. And congratulations to all our speakers for this successful webinar. Now, let us proceed with acknowledging these people who had given us their time, knowledge, and expertise for this webinar. We would like to request Dr. Ligaya Braganza, Program Chair of School of Food Science and Technology, to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our four speakers. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Allow me first to congratulate the four speakers for a very informative and organized presentation. Okay, so, so first, uh, first certificate. The School of Food Science and Technology presents this certificate of appreciation to Alisa Rayala for sharing her knowledge as a speaker in the SFSC Food Technology Day 2021 webinar entitled Plant-Based Food Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Researches on the topic Healthy Sizing Pita Bread with Sweet Potato, held on June 18, 2021. Given this 18th day of June 2021 at the Philippine Women's University, signed Ms. Debbie Alcasabas, the thesis advisor, and yours truly, Ligaya Braganza, the program chair of the School of Food Science and Technology. Congratulations, Ali! 
Okay, the next certificate is given to the School of Food Science and Technology presents this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Mark Gregory Patrick S. Suyap for sharing his knowledge as a speaker in the School of Food Science Te and Technology Technology Day 2021 webinar, Plant-Based Food Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Research on the topic, Ube Growth is Found in Your Loops. Held on June 18, 2021. Given this 18th day of June at the Philippine Women's University, Manila, signed by Ms. Maria Divina Alcasabas, the thesis advisor, and yours truly, the program chair. Congratulations, Mark. Oh, I forgot. Next, we go into Angel. Okay. The School of Food Science and Technology presents this certificate of appreciation. To Angela E. Gaho for sharing her knowledge as a speaker in the school SFST Food Technology Day 2021 webinar, Plant-Based Food Revolution on the Go, Undergraduate Innovative Food Research, on the topic, Nutritious and Natural Sweet Potato Chips, held on June 18, 2021. Given this 18th day of June 2021 at the Philippine Women's University, Signed by the thesis advisor, Ms. Maria Divina Casabas, and yours truly, the program chair. Okay, last but not the least, the School of Food Science and Technology presents this certificate of appreciation to Carla Justine R. Duenas for sharing her knowledge as a speaker in the SFST Food Technology Day 2021 webinar entitled Plant-Based Food Revolution on the Go. Undergraduate Innovative Food Research on the topic Lagundi as a Nutrient Enhancer in Pesto Sauce, held on June 18, 2021, given its 18th day of June 2021 at the Philippine Women's University, signed by the thesis advisor, Ms. Maria Divina Alcasabas, and yours truly, the program chair. Congratulations to all the four speakers for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you to Dr. Braganza and to our four speakers for joining us this afternoon. And for our closing remarks, let us welcome Dr. Ignacio Pablo, Dean Emeritus of School of Food Science and Technology. Dr. Pablo? I would like to greet Ms. Um, Angel May Sabella, watching from USC SCT CDO. Welcome, Ms. Angela, and thank you for watching for our webinar. And also, Ms. Baby Jane Pinomas, welcome to our webinar. And we would also like to acknowledge Ms. Jewel Cabinas, watching from USC CDO also. And also to Ms. Hazel Sanko. Um, thank you so much for watching in our webinar. And of course, welcome also to Julil Mars Marasin. Thank you also for watching on our webinar. We'd also like to uh, say hi to Ms. Nicole Roste. Thank you very much. And while we are waiting for Dr. Ignacio Pablo, we would like to thank the uh, professors, Ms. Levi Ramirez, Ms. Debbie Alcasabas, and Dean Ligaya Braganza for all your help and support on having this webinar. Thank you very much. And is Dr. Pablo here? Hello, Dr. Pablo? Hello, Dr. Pablo.
Alright. to me and uh, the, the choice of their study the, the materials that they the design of their study using raw material they have chosen 100 percent all of them the four on plant base and that's now the trend that's what customers want now globally healthy delicious food they call them healthy delicious food they should be plant-based because the animal based food are very high in saturated fat and saturated fat is a major cause of heart attack and hypertension. So they've chosen root crops. And root crops is only round, non-seasonal. So to be able to maintain a price that will be affordable by the customer, they have to get a crop that is non-seasonal. All of them have chosen, uh, the three of them have chosen root crops, and one of them have chosen the herbal plant, the bundi. So my congratulations to them again. And uh, secondly, as far as uh, the um, industry, the consumer is concerned, on a consumer level, they can now apply the data they have obtained and they can do it in their kitchen. Just the pots and pans, burner, a cooker, uh, pots and pans, and a knife and a chopping ball. That's all they need. They don't need any equipment. And prepare these snacks for their children. So I would suggest that they're very good because they're delicious, guaranteed they were delicious based on their organoleptic. And for the industry, I think it's high time for them to take a look at healthy, uh, healthy nutritious food in the market. There's a global demand. In three years' time, the highly developed countries like USA, Europe, European countries, and uh, China are now almost 95% it started with 10% only of healthy delicious food, marketing healthy delicious food. Now it's almost 95%. The growth is tremendous. And I think in a year's time, in a year's time, the global market will never will come out with the law not to accept unhealthy, unhealthy foods. Because again, it's a, it's a concern for all that we want to be healthy, that we want to guarantee the consumer that they have uh, they, they, they will be healthy, they will go into healthy eating. The healthy eating is very important. So healthy delicious foods are to be provided to undertake a healthy eating. And now for the speakers again, for the industry, there's a need to rationalize their existing products on snacks. And uh, they're using Irish potato, uh, they're using trans fat, I think. But they have to rationalize it and make it's unhealthy, make it healthier because the market is no longer in a year's time. I project, I project that the market will not, and the customers, consumers will already be demanding healthy, delicious food, healthy and delicious. And so, uh, these three applicants, the four speakers after graduation, will apply to the snack industry, which is a big industry in the Philippines, as well as the sauce and the uh, bread bakery product, they should, they, they, should not, they should not give any second thought. They should be hired immediately. The speakers are very skillful, knowledgeable, and based on the presentation that I heard, I find them very eligible for product development or reformulation with, with products that are highly saleable in the market. So I think they have an opportunity to apply to the industry. And for uh, consumers, housewives, they can do it in their household. It can be done household way. I call it technology, Techno food technology, active food technology in the kitchen. So they can get the data 
and take advantage of preparing the snacks of their children. Because again, these are concentrated, these snacks are concentrated to supply the needed micronutrients. Calcium, we're talking about calcium, iron, and uh, vitamin D. Some of them are talking about it for their children, for the growth of their children, the normal growth of their children. These micronutrients are needed very badly. So parents or custom consumers can prepare this in their own kitchen, getting the data or the processing that was given using only pots and pans. No need for machine. But for the industry, they have to look forward because there will be a revolution that again I predict that unconscious healthy foods are no longer uh, available, are no longer uh, acceptable by the consumer. And uh, lastly, I would say I was given only five minutes. I thought I got the, I'm afraid I've gotten beyond the five minutes. That was the order of the uh, of the boss there. To give me only five minutes. Several times he repeats five minutes only. Sir, five minutes. So lastly, I conclude. My closing remark is: eat well, enjoy the food you eat, be well, healthy and strong. Reduce your hospitalization and enjoy life. And lastly, stay well, long longevity, live up to 100%. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Eat well, be well, and stay well. All right. So thank you, Dr. Pablo, for a warm closing remarks. So we are very grateful for our attendees for joining our session entitled Plant-Based Revolution on the Go undergraduate innovative food researchers. We would also like to encourage everyone to subscribe and follow our social media accounts, especially our TW Facebook page and TW YouTube channel. And for our registered participants, please accomplish the evaluation form to receive your e-certificate for this session. You can click the link at the video description after this session. It is also flashed on your screens. And your responses in the evaluation form are very much appreciated. It will be used for further improvement of our future webinars. Please take note that we will be accepting your evaluation form only until 6 p.m. All right, yes. And to those who are interested to watch the replay of our webinar, please stay tuned to the PW Facebook page. So once again, thank you to our speakers, Ms. Ali Rayala, Ms. Angela Gaho, Mr. Mark Suyat, and also Ms. Carlea Duenas for a very informative talk this afternoon. And also we would like to thank you, Ms. Maria de Pena Alcatavas and Mrs. Levina Ramirez, our professor in food science. And of course, this webinar will not be possible without our PW Multimedia. Thank you so much. And on behalf of our team from Food Science and Technology, thank you everyone for joining us. And this has been Alexa Jones Apresso. And this is Joanna Crisol. And to finally end this session, we will have the university hymn. Thank you and keep safe, everyone. Thank you.